Hello and welcome to a presentation from the St. Raymond and Otis Foundation for Freedom, Family and Faith. This is Anne DeSantis, Executive Director, and I have to with you today on this day, Carlos Solorzano. He is a Catholic author and a good friend. Carlos, welcome to our thank podcast. You. Hello, thank you for having me again. We do this periodically and it's always a lot of fun. It really is. And this one is part three of a series that we've been doing. It's called Our Lady, Our Mother. And on this series, we're going to talk about the Immaculate Conception of Our Blessed Mother and how it relates to our audience here, which is families in crisis, those who have been affected in some way by some kind of adversity or challenge or even a trauma. And so I'd like to start out by introducing also your book. Your book is called I Am His Mother. You can show it right there. It's a beautiful book. I actually love the cover of it as well. My brother did such a great job. Your brother-in-law, you said? My brother-in-law is a graphic artist. It, it was one of those things where my mother-in-law is like, you have to do this for your sister's husband. So, you know, <laughs> so it's he's great. It's a stunning book, really is. And it's a beautiful book that I absolutely love. And you gave it to me. So it's a treasured gift for myself. And I like to read the back of the book just so people have an idea of what this book is about. So it says, an ancient document has been unearthed in the city of Ephesus. And archaeologists have confirmed that it appears to be a Christian document from the first century CE. Scholars have studied the document and determined that it is not another gospel or an earlier form of an existing gospel, nor is it any type of Christian epistle. Theologians have analyzed the document and have identified it as a personal reflection of the life of Jesus Christ and believe the author to be Mary, his mother. Now, I know that the book is considered, quote, fiction, right? Correct. But Correct. You based a lot of it on fact because you yourself are a catechist and a, a teacher of religion mm -hmm. for so many years in, in Catholic school. And mm -hmm. so why don't we just start it with like, how did you come up with this idea for the book and what is the book about? Um, the idea was probably, I, I love films and it was a mixture of two movies. Um, one of them was called Mary Mother of Jesus that NBC had done Oh goodness, I think it was around the year 2000 because the it was interesting because the woman who plays Christ's mother is the woman who plays uh, the mother of Anakin Skywalker in the Star Wars prequels. So it's funny because a colleague of mine, he at the time, he's actually my daughter's godfather as well. He says, wow, they have an actress. She, she's, uh, she plays two of uh, the mother of two characters where there was no father in the conception because, you know, Anakin in the Star Wars legend was you know conceived by the force so it's kind of one of those you know sci-fi geek things so it was really just the, the thought that the, the movie was really jesus's story through his mother's eyes and then um another film that came out previous it was just called jesus and it was another made for tv film much longer though and there were just some additions in that movie of him with our blessed mother that um, I know sometimes that film, as well as even that, that um, animated film, Prince of Egypt, they had talked about how even when they made changes, they, they were really committed to keeping the spirit of the, the Bible. So they, they didn't try to sway it or like convince us something else happened or whatever. And it was just there were little additions that were very beautiful, in my opinion, where um, I think one time I, I mentioned in a previous conversation, um, there were some some scenes where like she talks to Mary Magdalene and then even just her with him. And the one that I that's standing out in my mind right now was it's a very beautiful but painful scene was it's not in the gospel. But after he tells his followers in, in three days, I'll be killed. Um, he's alone with her and it's a very quick scene. But she asked why? Because and he says, I must give everything and hold nothing back. And wow, you know, it, it, she's sad and she's hurting but you know and we forget that you know we talk about jesus's humanity but she also had to deal with that as a mother and and you you know as a mother too there is a connection to the child that you know and i i love my kids without words but i did not carry them and deliver them i do not know that connection and i think that that's 
to be honest, in, in, in today's world, that's something that I don't take lightly. And I, I actually will tell my students, like, well, look, you know, I, I, I'm not going to get into an argument about a lot of the ideological phenomenons going on right now. But, you know, having been with a woman twice who was pregnant and then being in the delivery room and seeing what she went through, because both my children were C-sections. Uh, so it was, it was there was that and then watching her post delivery and the healing and but then really watching her instincts as a mother just kick in and, and, and just watching all that. I'm like, the woman is a, an amazing creature. So, and, and her biology is what, what makes her that. And so if there was no significance to our blessed mother, why, did, why is there any emphasis at all on Jesus's conception and his origins? We should have just waited for him to show up to John the Baptist, but yet there, we know of his mother. So there has to be a reason for that. And, um, so as you know, as Catholics, we, we are, we are taught that. And, and it's interesting because we'll get to this when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, but I figure I might as well jump on it now. You know, a lot of times, you know, when we have the conversations with non-Catholics, you know, the whole thing comes up, well, where's that in the Bible? And I've learned that I think the best way to respond to a lot of these theological differences, because again, people will just start arguing. I had a conversation similar to this a couple months ago. It wasn't about our Blessed Mother, but it was with a musical colleague of mine who's an evangelical. And she was like, well, where's that in the Bible? I think we're talking about purgatory or whatever. And I just said to her, I go, you know, I mean, first of all, we're at a, at a performance. So I'm like, I, I really don't want to get into this right now. Yeah. We're about to go on stage in 10 minutes. I go, but um, I said, I don't even know if we can really talk about this. And she's like, well, why, why not? I go, because you and I do not even approach the Bible the same way. We, until we have a common ground on how to interpret the Bible, because you can tell me it's not in the Bible. I will show you that the biblical origins or the biblical justification, but you still may not agree with me, but you know, I'm trying to show you it is biblical. But, you know, and even among Protestants, you have like Lutherans and Presbyterians and et cetera. They don't agree on a lot of things, too. And they're using the Bible. So I'm like, until we can even come to a common ground on how to interpret the Bible, I don't know what we can really get to. And, and I think we shouldn't try to apologize for for that. I mean, this this is that Bible alone approach is a theory in a sense. It's not absolute so and i get it i understand the origins of it too even where historically speaking it kind of pushed them in that direction because a lot of the uh protestant reformers had lost faith in the authority of the church i get that but it's just you know you're you don't you didn't discover you know this infallible way of interpreting the bible i mean a lot of it also is through the lens of that time period so yes it, that's it's a great really, point it's a, i mm -hmm. like that phrase of a lens of that time period that makes a lot of sense because you're right, it's not the same playing field when you're only looking at sola scriptura, which is just the Bible alone, as you said, because uh, with a lot of this, it, it's also going to be tradition mm -hmm. and what's been passed down and what we know and believe as Catholics and what, you know, what's been passed along, maybe not written, but it is part of what we believe as, as part of the Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we also, of course, believe in revelation. And I think the whole unpacking of truth. I mean, I think that it's one of those things where the magisterium is so important because, you know, the apostles were going to die. They were going to have to pass on um, the teachings and it's going to be further taught. And, um, and as far as like clarified, I guess you could say in later generations, I mean, in a lot of ways, I've become very interested in the last couple of years in apologetics, like really digging into it. And, um, I'm fascinated by so many scientific discoveries that that um, reinforce our faith. So, um, and as Catholics, you know, having the Vatican Observatory, and you know, of course, we started the university system in Europe. I mean, education is a huge part of of what we what we believe and what we do as a church. And it's interesting because I'll even tell my students how in the medieval universities, the the priests, the first subject they study was natural philosophy which is actually science mm. so it's you know and look at i mean uh pope francis is a chemist uh you know obviously brother guy he um who leads the um vatican observatory he's an astronomer he got his phd at you know university of arizona um hey 
I, where you're I have from. to, I, yeah, I still haven't got up to the observatory out here, but I will. But so this is all part of who we are. And, you know, it's exciting when we learn more of, of really the creation that God gave us because of science. You know, uh, there are some churches that they, you know, they, they shy away from psychology or, or science and say it's, a, it's meant to deceive us. No, it's not. It's, it's meant to show like how many scientists will say and have said for centuries that studying science gave them a stronger faith because they, you know, they had a, um, they had questions and, and they said the gaps were just not being filled and, and but they could see a design in creation. So I, I love that. And, and, and it's something that's becoming, that's really piquing my interest. And my plan hopefully is in 2023 is to start actually doing some independent coursework on some apologetics. Cause I think we're really, as a church, we really need to deal with secularism. And it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a huge obstacle and a lot of us aren't equipped to handle it. And I'm telling you, I am, I am so indebted. I mean, I want to throw a shout out. I, and I have had no interaction with these people and I have, I'm not getting any nod from them, but I have to send a shout out to our, our brothers and sisters at Catholic Answers because they are phenomenal and they are they putting are. out resources that just really, they've equipped me with a lot of, a lot of great um, material to dialogue with some people so well, the, the key word there is equipped because that's what mm -hmm. we need we need to be equipped and and speaking of the word equipped i think that that's what you're doing on this uh presentation that you're doing which is our lady our mother and as that's the the primary topic but then mm -hmm. the secondary topic we're going to discuss is the immaculate conception of our 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 lady and so without further ado, then I would love for you to just give your whatever you would like to, to say on that in that realm. Sure. Um, explain to the audience what is the Immaculate Conception. And, you know, our audience is those families in crisis, families and individuals who have gone through some kind of tragedies, adversities, traumas, whatever it is. And we know Our Lady loves us so much and that she's interceding for us and that immaculate conception was the reason and why she's even able to do it right i mean because she was brought into this world immaculately and is able to be not only the mother of jesus but our mother right our lady our mother just like the sure. title of this uh talk so i'm going to hand it over to you for a little while and um please just educate us on that if you would i i'd be glad to um I'm going to kind of approach it a little differently. Um, you know, obviously we can get into all these doctrinal things like the whole with the visitation and the angel with the Greek saying full of grace and how in the, I'm not going to butcher the Greek word. It starts with a K is a long word, but it's essentially in perfect tense. So it's like right now. So the idea is that when he's speaking to her and identifying her as one with that's full of grace, she exists in the present in that way. And it was not based on, the fact that she had the uh, visit from the angel it was because she was that way that's her that's who she is and um it's interesting to me because when i think about it um you know like sometimes people will go into certain things like a lot of times the the big argument that people use against it is romans three twenty three, where it says all have sinned and need to be saved essentially i'm paraphrasing and you know a lot of times i think what we're guilty of because we were speaking earlier about how you know, the, the Reformation was seen through the lens of that time, we tend to sometimes look at the Bible through our time period. And it's like, that's not how it works. You know, yes, Paul said that about Christians as well. But, you know, I, you sit there and, and sometimes wonder, did Paul even know about Mary's conception? You know, I'm sure he maybe had interactions with her and learned whatever the other apostles would have known of her but that he also did not have that same experience with her to interact with her during Jesus's ministry. Now, I'm sure if he did have any time with her, I'm sure she loved him very much and, you know, certainly applauded and encouraged him for his conversion. But, you know, he may or may not have known, but the reality is, you know, we also have to remember that Paul was writing to the Romans, the Christians in Rome. So we're assuming that's, you know, we, we assume a lot of what they're thinking, but we don't always know specifically what the, what they're addressing. But I think one, one, the, one of the things that I would like to highlight is when I was younger, I had a conversation with my uncle, who's an oblate priest, and he used that comparison of the moon and the sun. And he talked about how the moon is, um, you know, when you see the moon in the evening, 
and it's beautiful. I mean, like, like out here, I remember around Halloween, you know, because certain parts of the world, the moon is big, you know, during that time of year. And it, it gets pretty big out here in October, but I mean, I've never seen it in person like they would see it in Montana, but it's beautiful. And he was commenting how, okay, the light of the moon comes from the sun. So the beauty of the moon is because of the sun, S-U-N. But, and Mary's like the moon and her beauty comes from the light of the sun, S-O-N. So what's interesting is we forget is, first of all, we receive our humanity from our parents. I mean, and, and even the, the, the condition of original sin. If Mary was with sin and Je I mean, Jesus received his humanity from his mother. I mean, he, he was born of the woman. So it's like if she was a sinner, then Jesus would have been a sinner. He would have been born with original sin. And if you think about it, her immaculate conception was necessary for his birth in the way he was. But that's also a reflection of him. Like when you look at the phrase mother of God, like I was just looking at those councils from way back when, when they're fighting over words. I'm like, you know, should it be mother of God, mother of Christ? I'm like, if you're emphasizing his his if his divinity as mother of any whatever you want to call it it's a compliment to him so this really still speaks of jesus's divinity because it was necessary and the one thing when i was thinking about this for a couple of days before um <clears throat> this this conference this uh, presentation i kept thinking about those bleeding eucharist miracles and the one thing in those miracles that just bottles my mind is that notion where in, in layman's terms they talk about how our blood has that quote unquote barcode and the barcode it's our parents like my blood would have it would you would see my mother and my father in there i mean that's just what happens because we all come from a mother and father and all of these bleeding eucharists and even some of the bleeding statues that appear to be authentic miracles they only have one parent in the profile and it's like, okay, so obviously if your father was God the Father, that makes sense. But this is sacred and holy and precious blood. He got that from his mother. So logically speaking, it's a no-brainer. And it's interesting because when you bring up the full of grace part in the gospel, there never I've, I've yet to see any refutation as far as, well, that's not the way. It's there. It is in the Bible. It's just the problem is it's like people will say, like, you know, the big thing right now, it's kind of a side note, but like when people today will bring up a, um, a specific um, behavior in, in the world and they'll say, well, Jesus never addressed that. Therefore, it must be OK. It's like, well, no, he did address it because he said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He gave us the right way to interpret and to live the law, but he's not going to sit there and recite every single letter of the law. If he's sitting here already saying, I'm not here to throw it out, but I'm here to show you the way you're supposed to live it. So in, in essence, he did address whatever behaviors that are cited in the Old Testament as being sinful or immoral, but he showed us how to deal with it. We're not going to stone people to death. You know, we'll love them, but we will actually, you know, like I saw this thing recently where it said, yes, Jesus sat with sinners, but he did not sin with them. He, he was in company with them which we're supposed to do as well, because that's how you call them back to the Lord. But, but, um, but again, you know, these are things that it, it, they're all a reflection of Jesus. You know, there's a necessity to this. I mean, and it's interesting because on one hand, isn't it funny how we'll sit here and read miracle stories? Like let's use, let's use the Exodus event. I mean, there, there was a famine, which is why Hebrews went into Egypt. Now we have a lot of horrific things that happened in the world. And like, you know, that old notion of you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, which does happen, unfortunately, to some people. But the reality is because of the free of the freedom we have, you go to this place and say, God forbid, there's a shooting or something or an earthquake or whatever, and you die. Well, you made the choice to go there and be there. And because of that, unfortunately, you were caught in the crossfire or, you know, you were unfortunately present when there was some natural disaster. Well, the question I would ask is even, you know, we know God made a promise to Abraham to, you know, for the people, of course, but you could also argue, well, why would God have to intervene? Because they chose to go to Egypt and unfortunately were enslaved. So that shows that whenever it's necessary, God will intervene. So as the, as the theologians say, 
she was redeemed, but through anticipation, not the way we are. But the one thing, and when you talk about families in crisis, and in my opinion, this is the huge part. So if she was spared of original sin, did we put her on some throne and she's like ruling us forever? No, she lived a life that was full of poverty, struggle. I mean, Jesus is an infant and they have to flee to Egypt out of fear. When they return to the Holy Land, they go to a different place because, you know, there's still a threat for them in where they would have originally gone. She, her life was not without struggle. You know, they were not a rich family. They, and, and you know, they were certainly, I'm sure, always looking over their shoulder because of Herod or just wondering what's going to happen. This is Jesus, the Messiah. And mind you, you know, like an like I, 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 example I'll give is my mother, when, when it's Holy Week and they read the Passion at church, it always gets to her because she loves Jesus. Well, who, if you think about it, she stood at the foot of the cross in absolute agony as his mother. You know, I, you would know, I mean, like they say, there's no mother who can separate herself from her child's suffering, but she also watched her God die. And only we, only we could look at our, our Lord that's dying or suffering. We can't look at him and see him as our child. And mind you, if you think about it too, Joseph was also gone at this point. So she doesn't even have him to lean on. So she actually had to know and, and her fiat that makes it so much more powerful if you say yes this is what you're getting yourself into you know it reminds me of something christopher west said um at one of the courses where he said could you imagine that interaction in heaven when the father told the son you're going to go get your bride but here's what you got to do to get her well mary's suffering may not have been that bad it was pretty close I mean, she, she endured something that no other Christian will ever have to endure because the Savior was also her son. So while we honor her, we should certainly honor her even more because she took on that burden. And it shows us that, and that's the hard part is, you know, she certainly, I mean, we sit here and look at Jesus and, you know, the criminals on the cross who were, you know, who were mocking him, the soldiers who were mocking him. Well, what was she feeling? She saw that happen. She saw the, the, the criminal on the cross. If you're the son of God, save it yourself and us. She, she saw the Roman soldiers, you know, mocking him. She saw the leaders, you know, if you're the son, you know, mock, you know, all that stuff that happened. And she didn't react. I mean, I mean, I'm a teacher. I mean, there's those lots of stories of, you know, the angry parent that comes to school. And, you know, we sort of get it because, you know, it's your child and you're upset that someone's giving your child a hard time. So you exercise a little more patience, you know, because, yeah. I get the same way with my kids, but, um, you know, still it must have been very hard. She was still human to endure that. So, um, you think about what that teaches us, you know, with Jesus, of course, to, to love our neighbor, to understand that there's an underlying reason for the, why they're maybe acting a certain way. But then for Mary to really, I mean, I, I'm always marveled at the fact that she would have to go against her maternal instincts to stand at the foot of the cross with him. You know, that's why I, I, know I, I know I said this in a previous talk, but when you watch the passion of the Christ, when he falls and she goes to him, everyone talks about that part. And it's like the only part where it seems like he has some comfort because, okay, mom's here. I'm all right. You know, and I, and you know, you, we work, you know, you work with families in crisis. You know, I have those talks with parents at my job or whatever. And, you know, sometimes from the uh, personal crises to just the kids struggling with their grades and, you know, but mom is there to, or the parents there to, you know, you're not alone. You're here. I'm here with you. And, and a lot of times that's, you know, like they say, you know, when, when you look at someone and they can say, Hey, I, I know what you've been through. You know, we, we've, we've all gone through things where um, you ask yourself, well, why is this happening to me? And sometimes we don't know, like, I mean, it's just life, but, but then later on, when you meet someone who's going through similar thing and you become that person that they're like, Oh, I'm not alone in this. You know, I, and, and you've gone through your experiences so you can then go to them and, and be able to say, okay, I, I know what you're feeling. I've been there. 
I'm still dealing with it. You know, it, it's, it's ongoing, but um, I'm able to, I, I know what you're feeling. And, and, you know, she, that's the beauty of, you know, obviously she's a woman, but Jesus is incarnation, him being a, a also, you know, fully God and fully man is he understands. I mean, a lot of people in the world experiencing rejection. I mean, Jesus is the perfect person to go to with that. He, he knows what that feels like. So, I mean, I think um, this little thing that we honor in her that is really huge if we really try to, un, you know, and again, you know, I don't know how much they would have thought of this in the first century. And, you know, and I know sometimes we think about this 2000 year old church, but, you know, these are all insights that we can sit down and reflect on and share. And, and just so many insights I've learned so much from, from other people of faith, you know, theologians to like that grandmother that prays the rosary daily and that and the graces that she has in her faith because she has that trust and, you know, I, innocence or, I mean, I look at some people like that and I, I wish I had their faith. Like I, I remember one time being at this uh, New Year's Eve event and it was one of those celebrate recovery um, events. And um, all these people were former addicts. And, and um, you know, so it's like soda and, you know, cookies because you can't have alcohol, obviously. And they were just so nice to us and, and um, they're like, yeah, I can't believe you'd hang out with a bunch of old drunks on New Year's Eve. And I'm like, no, you don't understand, man. I, I'm loving this because here's a person that that has been through hell in their life. You know, I mean, and I've never been into drugs, but, you know, people who um, addictions and, you know, they hit the bottom of the bottom. And you talk about a person who in that condition, if you give your life to the Lord, they have a faith that I wish I had. There's such a trust because they've, they've been through the worst part of, of what most people will go through. And in that, the Lord picked them up and, 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 it, and they learned it. And a lot of them probably got into drugs because they didn't have anyone to love them. And then through Jesus, you know, someone loved them and they were able to trust someone. So, you know, I want to be them, you know, I want to be them. Like, like it always reminds me one time, this is kind of a side thing, but there was an interview someone did with Michael Jordan one time. And they asked him, what is it like to be surrounded by people like your fans? Cause you're Michael Jordan. And he says, well, a lot of people don't think that I noticed them because there's so many of them. He goes, I do. And he said, because you remember how his father was killed in 93. He goes, I noticed the dads and their sons the most because people look at me and think I, I want to be Michael Jordan. He goes, I look at them and I go, I want to be you. I don't have my dad anymore. You know, he's like, I want to be you guys. I wish I was because I don't have my dad. So it's just, you know, it's, it's, there's so much that we don't realize how important we all are and how we all have some form of loss that, that, you know, we suffer with. Yes. Amen. Wow. You did a wonderful job with that uh, presentation there about not only the Immaculate Conception, but about the suffering of Mary and about how her relationship with us is real. It really mm -hmm. is. And, and I think that's what I love so much about the series that we're doing, Our Lady, Our Mother. And uh, I thought maybe at this time we could just discuss a little bit of questions. Um, I have a question or two, and I know we have a guest there as well. Um, and my question would be just in your own life and your knowledge of the Immaculate Conception, what has that meant to you? Because to some people, that's a real mystery, you know, uh, what the Immaculate Conception means and what it really means to us. There are some priests and, and uh, other religious and even people that I know personally that like this is their favorite feast day. For whatever reason, they chose this day as like the most important of the Marian feast. So I just want to know if you had anything to say about that. I, I find it interesting because obviously she's a role model of, of faith and total trust in God. And, you know, we're invited to follow her and, and, and we look at all that God has given to her. And, you know, we, we're taught that, you know, he wants to give us the same. And the beautiful thing about that is she wants us to, like they always talk about how, like with those genuine apparitions or whatever, she's always directing us to Jesus. So it's interesting because, she wants to share him with us. 
you know, and how many times like it's kind of cute when you watch, like I was watching this uh, documentary about the pitcher Nolan Ryan recently, and he married his high school sweetheart. And, and, and his wife was talking about how, and he's in his 60s now, so they've been together for a long time. And she talked about how he was a really good pitcher in one of his high school, one of the scouts for the professional baseball told her, you, you realize you're going to have to share him with the world. And he, she, and she kind of laughed and she goes, I don't want to share him. He's mine. You know, it's like, but she understood that she's been, she's always been supportive, but it's like, you know, she wants us to see him for who he is. Cause she knows how much he loves us. And she's had, you know, the full taste of that as, as a person, but in her trust she's received. So she knows what we get from him and she wants us to, to experience that. So in a lot of ways, it's encouraging. And you had brought up the word mystery. And it's interesting because I remember taking a course where they were saying in the Eastern church, they call sacraments mysteries. And I love that. In when I read um, a lot of the catechism, I, I have, in the last 10, 15 years, I've really learned to love the word mystery because what it does for me is it it's taught me to release myself from the, the, the thought that I have to understand everything. Like I remember one time watching this astronomer say, look, w you know, the physics breaks down after the big bang, like for whatever trillionth of a second to the expansion. He goes, we can't explain it. What happened? He said, and he goes, well, what people don't realize is even if we can figure that little piece out and what caused the big bang, he goes, it will still lead to a thousand more questions. He goes, we, he says, we won't know everything. And it's funny because a lot of us, whatever disciplines that we have, we think we have all the answers and we don't. And, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's like that marital idea when you embrace the idea that your spouse is never going to fully fulfill you. God will. So it takes the pressure off of a person like, I'm not perfect. I can't fix everything. Um, so I'm encouraged by the fact that God gives us all, he wants to give us all that he given to the saints and to his mother and, you know, those in heaven. But, um, you know, we just have to trust and, and we, you know, follow her example to trust. But I, again, I love the idea that there's just something we never will fully understand. And knowing that in heaven, we have an eternity to grow closer to God. Like, it's like that thing where, you know, the life you have with your loved ones, you spend all those years getting closer. And it's like, that doesn't end in heaven because that's that's a good thing. And, and one thing I'd like to bring up, this was something I, I, I read in a Catholic Answers article, is a lot of people were talking about how part of what makes us human is sin. And it's like, well, hold on. There was a time before the fall that there was no sin. The angels that never fell, never sinned. So creation isn't about sin. It's about holiness. It's, but that, that comes from God. You know, if we turn away, that's that's on us. But it, it, you know, there's so much mercy in Him that, you know, He still finds a way for us to, to, to come back. You know, there's always that that notion of we can always, like it's like Lent or you know New Year's resolutions. Okay, you you, you mess up. Well, then start tomorrow. Just do it again. Start over. Yeah, I love how you express that. That and also talking about the mystery and. You know, it's got to be personal to all of us, isn't it? Because Mary and Jesus are both very, very personal. They're mm -hmm. universal, but they're personal too. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I didn't know if, if, you know, one last question would be that as we're entering into this Advent season, I mean, obviously just started last weekend and we're only mm -hmm. in that going into that second week. And this Immaculate Conception is a, is a very, very big feast day. Um, how do you think people can celebrate that um, because, you know, when any, any feast day in the Catholic church is a, is a big thing and mm -hmm. it's especially those holy days. So how can we really reflect on what this feast day can mean to all of us and to be closer to our blessed mother? It's a solemnity, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, what do you think about this immaculate conception? I, I, I remember when they had that conjunction, I think it was last year with, of the where it, they said, this is what it looked like in Bethlehem. And I have a picture of it that, that I guess NASA took and it, it just, there's that hope. And the manger, when that baby in the manger, that was hope that that's God's promise. You know, the, I mean, the same God that made the 
promise to the Hebrews, and that's why the Exodus event happened. You know, you're going to have this land, you'll be my people, you know, to intervene. So here's a God that, I mean, there's certainly challenges we have where we are, um, we have to live and we have to follow what we're taught and struggle. But at the moments that there has to be intervention, he will. So in that sense, the Immaculate Conception to give his son the right, you know, if you want to say bloodline to be perfect. You know, God did what he had to do with his his mother. And of course, we know from her parents, they were a very holy couple, which makes sense. And 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 the fact that they um were um the perfect people to rear her, you know, at, at, besides the fact that she was conceived in this way. And that that right there reminds me of Joseph. Because I remember when we were at that CMN thing a couple summers ago, you know, the Saint, it was the year of St. Joseph. And, you know, I, I think we were talking about how I, I was doing all these presentations that year on Joseph. So I'm like, I better do my homework. So I started looking up all kinds of stuff about him, but also where they live, what he, you know, carpentry, whatever. And to see that here's a person who was not immediately conceived, but he, he was a righteous man. And of course, righteousness, you know, the, the, how many people in the Bible were described that way? Him, Abraham. So he's in pretty good company, but he still was, he was the one that guided Jesus, you know, the father raising a son. So you have this notion of, you know, we have some, we were given the tools by God in this imperfect world to, to, you know, learn and, or to rear our kids or et cetera. But at the same time, you know, while this gift was given to Mary, she was not without struggle. So the hope is there because God has shown us what he'll do to save us. But her life and Jesus's life also shows that even if you are a holy person or all holy person, you have struggle and, and, their, and their life shows us how we should live our lives. And now it's not easy. Like I was saying earlier, you know, she went against every maternal instinct at the foot of the cross and also to let God's will be done. I mean, you know, like I said, like that part in the movie where he set, tells her, I must give everything. You know, that was heartbreaking. The way they acted that part out, it was beautiful, but it was painful. Like he says, I have to die because what you, if you die for someone, you give everything. You know, and it's interesting. It's, it's almost like the soldiers where, you know, they talk about that they want the death on the, they want to die in battle because they want to give all of themselves for the service, whatever it's a nation or whatever it is for the service of the cause. So, um, you know, they, we, it's, it's amazing how much strength comes in having to be, having to restrain yourself sometimes. But in that sense, they were also showing love to those who were mocking Jesus. And that had to be really hard. Mm. Wow. And especially in our culture today, you know, us, how do we, how do we respond to people who mock our faith, which it's, it's, it's a very big thing now. It's a very big thing. It's a real thing. So thanks for bringing that up. And, you know, we're in Advent right now, but honestly, I mean, Lent is also around the corner. You're giving us a lot of food for thought for Lent too, with the suffering of Jesus and his passion and everything like that. Um, I didn't know if anyone had any questions that are on this call. Um, if they do just please uh, speak up, but, uh, you know, if not, I would say, Carlos, if you had any uh, closing thoughts, um, but I'll just wait a second to see if anybody has any questions. Sure. So uh, then please do, Carlos, give us your closing thoughts on this topic. And also, you know, obviously you did write this book. Yes. I Am His Mother, which is a book that I treasure. You also Thank gave you. me this beautiful little note inside <laughs> as a, a thank you, because you did a podcast with uh, my podcast co-host, Bill Snyder and I, and, and it was such a nice thing that you did. Thank you. But please do give us those closing thoughts before we end this, uh, this program. Did you want me to go on the book or was it, um, I'm just. Oh, either book. way. Yeah. Let's talk okay. about then you um, buy the book would be wonderful. I, I think the, the journey of the writing of it was, um, was a blessing. Um, it was interesting because um, I was saying earlier, when you deal with something in life, um, 
usually it's a struggle that you go through. There's comfort for someone else to know that, you know, someone else has gone through that. I mean, I, I've gone through a lot of things where um, I work with people who were there for me. Like I, I had mentioned my uh, daughter's godfather earlier. He was actually my um, first real teaching mentor when I started teaching. So, I mean, I, I'm indebted to him. You know, I mean, I haven't even worked with him since 2000 and 2005, but I, he's someone I'll, if I have a out there idea, I still call him and, and just, just, just to bounce ideas off of him. Um, and now, you know, in, at my age and in my time in the profession, I'm, I'm working with young teachers and, hey, I've been there, hey, I, you know, when they're struggling, hey, I've been there, hey, I've been there, you know, so it, it comforts them. And I go, yeah, it'll get better. You just got to be patient. And, and then, you know, sometimes the kids will tell me things about them. I said, well, do you know the kids really speak highly of you? And, you know, they really love you and they really appreciate you. So that, you know, that's empowering. So it was one of those experiences where I was talking about her being fully open to him and, you know, in her fiat. And, and, and I talked a lot about, you know, what she had to endure. But another, uh, one of the things that, that really humbles me is, is I've had a lot of women tell me, how did you know? How did you know? And, I, and I'm like, how did I know what? They go, this is what we feel. My mother told me that too. Like when my mom read it, when, <laughs> when she called me to you know, finish the book, I was, I was scared because <laughs> I was afraid of, that's not how we feel to, that is heresy. I mean, I was waiting for all the mother things and she, she loved it. And it, it was one of those things where I felt like I was privileged to get a glimpse of what it's like. And, and so, um, and considering that it, it just sort of hit me one day and I, it came out pretty quick. I, I, I feel like, it, you know, it's one of those glorious moments where I got to feel that joy, like, like, the, like, the, like Mary's Magnificat. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, they say when she, you know, received this, she sang, like she just sang you know, she was so filled with joy and she just, she just wanted to sing, you know, and, and I think that's beautiful. And it was weird because considering that I was just letting my, my, I wouldn't even say my imagination, I'd say my heart just go. And I remember telling you before, I, I just played a lot of Marian music in the background. I just, I just let it, and I'd find versions of certain songs that were just glorious and just let it, let it hit me. And, and I took it in and, um, Anytime, so anytime I see any type of Marian art that that is beautiful and like like a painter who comes up with this gorgeous visual of her, I I get all into it. Like a couple of years ago, they have a there's a composer here in Tucson, Carlos Sapion. He uh, he works at the cathedral downtown and he writes music. He writes liturgical music, and we use some of his mass parts during the the year wonderful wonderful person great singer a beautiful composer and he actually wrote his own ave maria and, and um during the christmas uh performance it was the last one they did before covid you know and he's he wrote this music i mean he's performed this a million times he's i'm certainly rehearsed it a, a gazillion times he he uh he, he broke down while he was singing it and my wife knows him really well so like after the performance you know and when he did, everyone just applauded and then he stopped and they started over and he got to the song. And, you know, he's classically trained. So when we talked to him after the performance, he was like, yeah, I just feel really bad that, you know, I, I, I didn't get through the song and it, I didn't do it right. And I said, no, I said, that's supposed to do that to you. I said, that's why we, we make this art. So for me, it's like, okay, I, I, I mean, I, I'm humbled to, to have been blessed with this book that came from me, but then I was blessed to, to hear his treasure that he gave to us that day and the performance. And of course it's, it's available for people to hear it or, or buy it or use it, whatever. And as, as along with other um, Marian art, like I've, I've come across, I mean, there are so many beautiful um, faith-based artists out there. there. There's a lot of young Catholic visual artists, digital or painters that they are coming up with some, oh, just some moving, um, beautiful pieces of art and, and they're sharing with the world. So it's just, you know, whatever is moving there in their heart to do that. And, and so to me, it's like, okay, you know, 
everyone is giving that grace to each other that they receive. And, and, and again, even the, you know, our grandmothers who share insights, you know, the, from their prayer life, you know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but, um, my mother told me this years ago, um, you know, you have all those like holy cards, you know, Fatima, Lourdes, Guadalupe, you know, all these apparitions. And my mom said that one time she talked to this really old lady, you know, short little lady with a rosary. And she asked my mom very softly, do you know what the difference between Our Lady Guadalupe and all the other ones? My mom's like, no. And she goes, and she was referring to Guadalupe. She goes, she stayed. Two words. And I was like, Oh, because all the other images they describe to the artists, this is what I saw. This is the print on the tilma. We see exactly. We can, I mean, you go to Mexico, it's there and we see it. So it's like mm -hmm. that little two word insight. I thought I'd never thought of that before. Oh, wow. That is absolutely beautiful. You know, we're going to have to do another one of these. We'll have to do part four. Maybe we can do that on Our Lady of Guadalupe. I think that would be a great topic. Now that will be coming up pretty soon, but we can always just do it after the fact too, because sure, we're sure. taping yeah, this in December 1st of 2022 and it's being produced, you know, in December of 2022. So let's talk about that. Let's do another yeah, one definitely. of these because I do think a part four, mm -hmm. and I'm even jotting this down. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget that Our Lady of Guadalupe would be a wonderful one. And I think that many people will be interested so uh carlos i want to just thank you for being a part of this program thank and you for having to me. all of the people that are watching this um, on the replay you know please do have a blessed advent and enjoy that celebration of this immaculate conception of our blessed mother any final words before we end no i just would say um obviously it's it's one of those days where it's really a joy to be at mass Mm. You know, my um, our parish, they they actually texted my wife yesterday, asked us to play music. So we'll be doing all these Marian songs. But, you know, it's one of those days for me where, you know, receiving communion is always a beautiful thing. But, you know, you, I, I'll think a lot more about, you know, I'm receiving what she gave to the world. It's it's just I, I've, I've learned to really appreciate thinking to myself how um, you can how he he gave her to us like you know like like sharing your mom is real you don't play around with that mm -hmm. you know like my <laughs> best friend he he passed away uh it'll be two years next month and i i mean i i, I knew him since 79 80 school year and i don't even remember when i started calling his mom mom i mean i, I might have been like 13 or 14 and it's just it never faced him i mean i still call her that you know and it's it's just you know it's it's beautiful and of course there's uh you know or if someone sees you in that type of role you know there's you know it's it's a beautiful experience but you know to know that jesus you know in the last one of the last things on the cross he did before he said it is finished is he gave his mother to john and you know representing the, the world the church you know he gave her to us mm. so it's just it's one of those things where where um you know he really did give us everything you know, his mm -hmm. life and his church and his and his, his mother spirit and his mother. Yeah. So amen. As, a, as a human being, he gave everything. And and then she, as the immaculate mother. Doesn't just give to her children, she get her well, her son, her she gives to all of us, you know, mm -hmm. like this, if, if this is who his bride is and, and the way I mean, you talked about recently your daughter got married. I mean, that connection, I'm sure to your son in law now. I mean, it's like now there's a, you know, there's a love for that it's person. family, that right? Yeah, because it's the son-in-law, but that's beautiful. This has been a wonderful presentation. Um, may I remind also our viewers of the end of the year, especially for a Catholic nonprofit 501c3. It's kind of that biggest um, giving time of the year. Now you can give to us through prayer. Actually, that's probably the biggest way that you can give to our nonprofit. But if it's in your heart and you would like to give to us in some way, shape or form, whether it be for a one time donation or something recurring, I would just say, please do go to our website at nonatus.org. We also have something called the I Give Catholic site that's right on nonatus.org. It's a very special giving, giving opportunity through our own archdiocese 
of Philadelphia. So go to nanatus.org and then look under support us to the I Give Catholic site. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. God bless. God bless everyone. We'll see you next time here with the St. Raymond Anatas Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith.